Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a pleasure and a privilege for me to uh, welcome here uh, Benjamin Ferent. Um, we know each other since about 20 years, I think. Oh, I'm not that old. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it sounds uh, like knowing him since a long time, but actually it's, it's uh, uh, slightly more than just one-fifth of um, um, uh, Benjamin Ferent's uh, lifetime. Um, just a few moments to remember. Um, after our first meetings, once upon a time, uh, in, a, in a panel at the American Society of International Law on the International Criminal Court, but um, I remember especially 2009 when I attended the conferral of the Erasmus Prize to um, Ben Ferenc by um, Her Majesty Queen Beatrix. Um, and the presentation to him in Washington by Deputy Mayor Saskia Brandes, who is also here, also special welcome to you, uh, in Washington DC last month in honor of your work. But what I especially remember is that wherever you speak, um, you are such, such a tremendous source of in inspiration for younger colleagues. And I think we can see that this afternoon as well. I always notice that when um, uh, Benjamin Ferenc has spoken that young people gather around him and, and want to hear more about your inspiring and impressive history with the history of international criminal law and your engagement with the future of international criminal law especially. Um, Benjamin Ferenc was a staunch proponent of international criminal justice and um, as a person he is a beacon of trust in the law. Now international law as a source of trust in a hyper-connected world is the focus of our current strategic research agenda 2016-2020 here at the Asser Institute. We examine how law as a social institution can contribute to the trusting relations for cooperation in this large, largely um, interdependent and hyper-connected world. Dealing with crimes against humanitarian and international law is essential in the protection of human dignity through the law. And therefore, we have very much been looking forward to welcoming you here at our institute this afternoon following um, the presentation of the walking path that carries now your name here in uh, The Hague uh, last weekend. My colleague uh, Christophe Paulsen, who is the organizer of our uh, supranational criminal law lectures, senior researcher at our institute, will um, um, uh, be the moderator of this uh, event and therefore um, Christophe may I ask you now to come forward and ladies and gentlemen thank you for being with us at this event and Benjamin Ferenc thank you so much for coming to our institute once more. Thank you Ernst. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, in addition to what Professor Hirsch Berlin has stated, I would like to mention that this lecture is organized indeed in the context of the Supranational Criminal Law Lecture Series, which is a lecture series on international criminal law, which has been organized since 2003 by the Oscar Institute and the Coalition of the ICC and the Croatia Center for International Legal Studies of Leiden University. Uh, in addition, uh, tonight's lecture is organized in cooperation with another partner, the International Humanitarian and Criminal Law Platform, which brings together researchers on IHL and I ICL from the Asser Institute, University of Amsterdam, the VU University of Amsterdam, Leiden University, University of Groningen, the Netherlands Defense Academy, Tilburg University, Maastricht University, and the Institute for International Law of the KMU Leuven. Now, we are extremely proud that after three years, we can again welcome Benjamin Friends to the Institute. And as Professor Hirsch Berlin has stated, Benjamin is a former uh, Nuremberg prosecutor. He's one of the biggest names in the field of international criminal justice. And he's also the reason why I personally decided some 
15 years ago at the Tilburg University to pursue a career in international criminal law. And Ben is able to inspire audiences around the world. And luckily for you, uh, you're able to witness this uh, for yourselves here today at the TMC Oscar Institute, where Ben will speak about his pursuit of international criminal justice. Ben, thank you so much for freeing up some time in your very busy schedule. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, is that better? Yes. Well, sorry for you, I have to listen. Um, thank you very much both for that very kind introduction. I gather that what I'm supposed to do here is to uh, tell you all about myself, to inspire you to continue your studies in international criminal justice, and not to discourage you by any observations which might diminish your wild enthusiasm for such a career, which has inspired Dr. Paulson to give up whatever useful work he is planning to do instead <laughs> to pursue a career in international criminal law. However, um, I come from a long line of criminals. <laughs> um, let me begin at the beginning. I was born in a little village in Transylvania. Nobody knows where Transylvania is. They do know about my Uncle Dracula, who was on my mother's side. Um, it was a little village. My sister was born in the same bed I was born, a year and a half before me, and she was therefore a Hungarian. When I was born, I was a Romanian in the same bed. <laughs> so I learned very early on that it doesn't make any difference whether you're Hungarian or Romanian or what the country is called. It's how you treat the people in the country that counts. And uh, in both countries, the treatment was such that in order to escape from poverty and persecution, uh, my parents took the two little babies they had, I was one of them, and fled to the United States. And of course, we had no money, so we traveled third class because there was no fourth class, and uh, <laughs> came on the open deck of a small ship uh, to the United States where my father was prepared to carry on his trade for which he had been trained. He was a shoemaker and he thought people were always going to need boots and uh, he could make a pair of boots out of a cow's hide. But nobody mentioned to him there were no cows in New York <laughs> and there were no cowboys <laughs> and they didn't need boots and you had to get to learn to read read the instructions on a machine before you could deal with it. So there was also no employment. And he was considered fortunate when some kindly soul offered him a chance to become a janitor before for a few houses and his family, including me and my little baby sister, uh, could live in the cell. And that's where we were born. I mean, not born, but the earliest knowledge was of a cell in the uh, region of New York called Hell's Kitchen. Uh, and it was called Hell's Kitchen because it was pretty close to hell. <laughs> and uh, so I mention this so that uh, you can take the view in perspective of uh, now I have a street in Holland named in my honor. <laughs> I'm planning to have a bench put in there so I can sit there all day long and just look at the name. <laughs> You're cordially invited when the bench gets so come and have a seat, no charge. I, I've been thinking about putting on a toll bridge there, but I don't think they will let me do it. <laughs> All right, so from these humble beginnings, uh, I'll take a quick jump. Uh, I was admitted to the Harvard Law School, where I got a scholarship for my exam on criminal law. Didn't know anything about taxation. <laughs> and some other problems. And uh, while I was still a uh, student, the war broke out. Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. Everybody I knew immediately went down to try to volunteer for military service. I applied to various different branches of the service. Uh, I was having trouble getting in because I didn't fit the description. In the Air Force, for example, where I wanted to be a pilot, uh, they measured me and said that 
your feet won't reach the pedals. <laughs> so they refused to accept me for that. And I had similar experience. I didn't look like a Marine. <laughs> and, but I did finally manage to join the Army as a private in the artillery. And of course, I knew absolutely nothing about artillery. Uh, and I also learned that armies are run by people who are sometimes right, <laughs> usually not. <laughs> and uh, they tried to undo all of my training. Whatever they told me to do, I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And they, <laughs> they said, you're not supposed to think. I said, you're in the army. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I've been trained to think. It, bam. <laughs> and I would always get punished, you know, for thinking. Uh, so I was at a very early stage opposed to militarism <laughs> based upon my initial experiences. Now, we go a little bit further into the, into the area. Uh, in the capacity of a private in the artillery, I landed on the beaches of Normandy. Uh, I uh, witnessed American soldiers lying face down, floating in the water, uh, with tanks still mired in the mud. Uh, I proceeded with the army across the Maginot Line and through the Siegfried Line and across the Danube, uh, or the, the, not the Danube, the Rhine, across the Rhine uh, on a pontoon bridge, on a driving a jeep, going like this, like this. The bridges were all knocked out. And if you didn't end up driving a, a jeep at the bottom of the Rhine, that was an accomplishment. Uh, and uh, I didn't quite enjoy the experience, I must say, but I learned something very important, that I can survive everything. And I think that has been a guide for me uh, in everything I do. I can never live as poor as I have been. I can never be subjected to more attempts to kill me than I have been, and that gives me an enormous strength. I fear nothing, <laughs> and uh, I'm so busy I have no time to get old. <laughs> I am now in my 98th year, uh, and still enormously busy. Uh, the more publicity I get, the more work I get. Very difficult, fortunately I have my son down here, whose principal job is to hold a whip and keep me going. <laughs> He's getting even with me. Uh, well, let me give you back a little bit of my army career, because some of it relates to what you're doing. Uh, I had decided very early that I wanted to pursue a career as a lawyer. Uh, I didn't know any lawyers. I knew a lot of criminals. The area of Hell's Kitchen was notorious as a high-density crime area. I didn't think it was a good idea to become a criminal. <laughs> and uh, so my interest was always in that direction. When I was in the Army, I wrote an article published in the leading law journal uh, on the rehabilitation of Army offenders, the soldiers who were imprisoned for various crimes and how they could be rehabilitated. I mention it because it was one of my earliest publications. Uh, I had published an article on criminal responsibility when I was 19 years old. Um, so it's something which I have been doing for a very long time and focusing my attention on crime and preventing crime. I was teaching juvenile delinquents in the summertime and visiting all the prisons and I'm happy to tell those of you who are from New York, we had an electric chamber, electric chair in Sing Sing prison where people were sentenced to death, were fried, and I have sat in that chair several times and uh, when studying criminology, and I can report it was too big for me. <laughs> I said, the electric chair doesn't fit. <laughs> so I tried to avoid having to be sentenced there. Um, all right, now on my army career. The days in the artillery were the usual thing. The Germans trying to kill us, we're trying to kill the Germans. Nothing very interesting. Uh, however, we reached a certain point where 
the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt at that time, and Stalin and Churchill had all agreed that because the Germans were committing all the atrocities, that there would be trials. And they were put on notice that they would be held accountable for the criminal actions they took. Now, one of the jobs I did when I was at the Harvard Law School was do the research for a professor who wrote a book on war crimes. It was Professor Sheldon Gluck, who was a leading criminologist at the time. And I guess it was, he was the one who suggested, but he was advising the army uh, as he was being consulted on, you know, war crimes problems. Nobody knew about it. He said, you go get my student, Benny. He's over there somewhere. And he knows all about those things, having read everything in the Harvard Law Library, which pertained to the subject. And one day, Corporal Ferenz, which was me, was interrupted in my important duties, such as doing the latrines, giving them clean, um, was told you're being transferred to General Patton's headquarters. And uh, I reported to a colonel, and he said that uh, your name has been forwarded from Washington. We are setting up a war crimes program. We've been ordered to set up a war crimes program. What's a war crime? He had no idea of what a war crime was. War crime meant absent without leave. It meant desertion. It meant crimes of that kind. But the, what we have come to learn as war crimes, unheard of. The first crimes that came to our attention were what we call the Allied Flyer cases, and when I say we, for a while, I was the only person. I was the first man assigned by the American Army to deal with war crimes, so I have a lot of firsts. Um, the second man who arrived was Private Jack Nowitz. He was been the engineers. <laughs> he was a private. He was covered with mud. He came, he saluted me and said, sir, I'm reporting for duty. I said, don't call me, sir. Go change that dirty uniform. We're working on war crimes. <laughs> he was also a lawyer and who spoke several languages. And then the two of us uh, were together in the Third Army. And uh, we have the reports of Allied flyers being killed. This is something which you don't hear very much about, but it was typical. Uh, when I was in the artillery, for example, we shot down enemy planes. That was what we were supposed to do. But if a plane came across and they didn't give the signal, identification, friend or foe, which meant they had to push a button and put in the code, and we didn't get the code, the guns would start shooting and shoot them down. And uh, it's not a very pleasant sight. I never go to Fourth of July celebrations. If you hit a plane which is coming back from uh, a mission somewhere and they have still munitions on board uh, and you hit that plane that explodes with tremendous force so much so that uh, I was on several several I don't know what to call them expeditions but search we would then get together all the soldiers stand side by side and walk through the field carrying a little cardboard box to find a piece of a human being that we might use to identify the body. And uh, if we were fortunate to find a finger or a clump of hair, uh, which would be useful to help to ascertain, you know, the people that we had shot down, British and American planes. So this was a personal experience, not a very pleasant one, but the worst was yet to come. Uh, sorry to be telling you these horror stories, but you want to know what you're dealing with. The Allied, typical Allied flyer case was where the persons had not been shot down by us, but had been crashed into the ground somewhere in German-held territory. They were almost invariably beaten to death by the German mob. Uh, would come down, Allied flyers, wounded, mob would come out, grab them, literally beat them to death with shoes or with sticks or with crowbar, whatever they had, and we would get a report, Allied flyers coming down in the town of Grossgerau near Frankfurt, actual case. Um, I'd get into my Jeep, race out to the scene, 
get the burgomaster or somebody else acting as the chief, I'd say round up everybody who was in the area, bring them into a room, half this size, line them all up, I'd get somebody who spoke German and English, at that time I didn't speak German, I never studied German, uh, I said, yeah, you tell them, they're going to tell the exact truth, what happened, who was shot down, who surrounded them, who hit them with what, where is the body located, it's one of the problems always, couldn't find the body, they'd been thrown into the river and they floated downstream, or they had been buried in a hole somewhere and I had to go and dig them up, try that one on. Uh, and um, the people would be told anybody who lies will be shot. Now I mention this, and I mentioned it this morning somewhere because I expect a reaction, which I usually get. What? You uh, said you would shoot him? Yes, I did. It was routine. I'd say to the translator, you tell them they're going to tell the truth of what they saw, who was in the mob, who hit him with what. Where did they hide the body? That's what I want to know. And anybody who lies to me will be shot. Well, so you what with us? It's a form of terrorism. Well, maybe it is. Uh, for your reassurance, I never shot anybody. Uh, but what other weapon did I have to persuade them? But I had already studied the war crimes law, and I knew there were judges and students here that there was a principle of reciprocity. In every town there had been a sign, Jews, Juden, you're going to be assembled here to be transported. Anybody who doesn't show up by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning will be Todesstrafe. They'll be punished by death. So on the principle of reciprocity, I thought that I could tell them the same. What else could I tell them? That I'm not going to give you your ice cream tonight? Or please be nice? What the hell do you think you're going to tell them? There's a war going on. They would kill me on sight. And they certainly would kill anybody who didn't show up and get organized to go get murdered. This was what was going on. So the threat of my threatening to shoot them was the only weapon I had. I had a 45 caliber pistol on my belt. Uh, with American troops were already there. So that the Germans were very frightened, they were very obedient, and they would start writing. And then I'd read 25 statements, 20 of them agreed, the other five were lying, but you could tell right away, if 20 of them agree on what happened, you know what happened. And uh, the other 25, I didn't shoot them. <laughs> I just ignored them. Uh, and then we'd pick them up and uh, put them on trial. I mentioned this because the public does not know about the U.S. military commission trials, which began during the war. And I was in Munich, I think, I hammered up the first sign, U.S. War Crimes, something or other, committee or whatever the title was. There was a photo of that, it's of it. My, my files are in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And uh, the procedure was, well, mostly we had we dealt with the concentration camps, so let me give you a word about that. As the American army swept into Germany, we began to encounter strange sights. Report were coming to headquarters, to the judge advocate section, that the tank division has come across a group of people, they're on the road, and they look like they're wearing pajamas. They all look like they're half dead and they seemed to be coming from some kind of a work camp. We didn't know the word concentration camp. And I would jump into the Jeep and head out for where it was. The first such camp was a four camp of Buchenwald, called Gusen. I'd rush to there, get to the camp. I had arranged a uh, special pass to be signed by General Patton, authorizing all commanders to give me full cooperation, that I was acting on behalf of the Third Army, the Chapatel's Army, carrying out a mission for the President of the United States, and I was to be given access and assistance in everything that I did. I had that signed by a lieutenant while he was sober a bit, <laughs> and uh, I used that as my pass in the event I was ever challenged. 
which fortunately I never was challenged. <laughs> but in order to make sure that I wouldn't be challenged, I put secret stamps on it, stamped it secret. Because one of my duties as a clerk in the supply room of the artillery was to file the files, whether people couldn't read. <laughs> and we'd get in the files, and I'd replace the old files, and I received some stamps, official stamps, official army stamps. And I thought it would be a good idea, instead of giving them only to the colonel and the majors, if I kept one in case they should need one at some time. <laughs> So I had the official stamp too, <laughs> which turned out to be very fortunate because in the event I needed an official document, well, of course, I had the official stamp, get somebody else to sign it, and uh, in order to make sure I wouldn't be interrupted, I put secret on it as well. And if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, you will find, I wasn't, I don't know if it's still there, but it was there a few years ago, I found a display of the pass that Ben Ferenc used. You go into the camps and get access to information, and there it is, Ben Ferenc, you know, please give assistance, all assistance to him, and it's stamped secret. And what amused me more was before they could post that, they had to get permission from the army to declassify the secret. <laughs> so they had marked secret, but declassified by the U.S. Army. <laughs> I don't know if there's a statute of limitations that <laughs> will come after me still, but it was a case of forgery for my country, <laughs> which turned out to be quite handy. But uh, the scenes in the camps, and as I came upon each of the camps, and I went from one to the other, and the idea was to get in as fast as you can and get the hell out of there as fast as you can. Every disease was there diarrhea and, and, and dysentery and I don't know what disease is. Everything was in total chaos. When we come in, you have to move fast because the SS is running away trying to escape. Some of the inmates who were still capable of moving and there were some Russian prisoners who were in pretty good shape still, uh, chasing them, catching them, beating them up, burning them alive. I've seen that too. Uh, Total chaos, the floors covered with dead and dying people, you don't know who's dead and who's alive. They're moving a little bit, you see they're alive, you look at their face, their eyes are appealing for help. Uh, crematoria going, smell all over the camp of course, rats, one very touching thing seen, which I repeat because I still a very image in my mind. Human beings in the mounds of garbage which were thrown out, clawing in the garbage like rats looking for a morsel of food that they could put into their mouth. Uh, all of that, that was the scene. Typical scene, basically the same in a whole row of camps that I visited. And it wasn't a visit, I was working. My job was to get into the Schreibstube of the office where they had the materials, collect all the documents, which the Germans were very obedient, and uh, they had nice records of who entered the camp when, who was the commander in charge at the time. And I mentioned something else which had moved me at that time and still does. One of the inmates in one of the camps, I don't remember if it was Buchenwald or Mauthausen or Havensee or, 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 or any of the other camps, when he saw me, he said, it was, it was an inmate in charge of clerical work in the sharpshoot, in the, in the office. He said, I have been waiting for you. He said, come with me, I have something for you. And he took me and he took me to the electrified fence which surrounded the camp, took a shovel, and he dug up a box. It was about the size of this bag, a square box. And he took me back to the office. We uncovered the box, cleaned it up. And inside, there were a number of, this is something else I'll give you later. It has nothing to do with the story, but it looked like this, little folders. And uh, it was the club, which the SS had in the camp. And they used to go to the club once a week or so. And then they had a stamp in there. And they had the man's picture and his name. It was an ID card for admission to the club or something like that. And when the card was full, he had to issue a new card. He was supposed to destroy the old one. Instead of destroying it, 
He saved it. He hid it. Every time he did that, he took his life into his hands. Because if they had ever caught him with any one of those, they would have killed him on the spot. Nevertheless, he had a box full of them. A joy for a prosecutor. I knew the names of the officers, the SS, who were in the camp. I knew when they were there. I knew what they looked like. I had their birthplace. A uh, beautiful piece of evidence. But what was most remarkable is that this man, <coughs> facing death every time he saved a card, still for at least a year period, saved those cards, knowing or hoping that there would be a day of reckoning. Excuse me, I still have, you know, this picture still comes back to me. I was the day of reckoning. He gave me those cards. The fact that a person didn't lose hope under those conditions, you know, uh, touched me. Anyway, I'm doing a little picture of what it's like, you know, to be a war crimes investigator. I had to go out and dig up bodies with my hands because they were covered over. And you can't, in winter time, the, heart of the, the ground was very hard. You couldn't use a pick because you hit him in the head. You wouldn't know if it was a bayonet wound or a bullet wound. I uh, had to soften the ground all around. I'd get some Germans, stop them, and say, come on, I need a hand with this. Uh, and then drag them out uh, of the hole. Uh, and how do you do that? If you, in case you need it, these are professionals all here. Give you some feeling of what it's like. I had it my own system. You identify the body, locate the body parts where they're placed, try to get an ankle, uh, maybe two, only one, you try with one, tie the rope around it, put it at the back of the Jeep, and start to pull it out of the hole. And hope that you get more than a foot or a leg when you get out, when you pipe and look. I've done that. Not a pleasant job. Nobody came apart on me, really, I was happy to say. Uh, but then to wash down the body, photographers come in, take pictures of it. You find out who was in the mob that killed them. Find out who was the guy who delivered the fatal blow. It was a fireman, for example, actual case, uh, who came and he cracked the skull open of the flyer who had come down and said, that's what I like. Good American blood all over his shirt. Uh, and the others quoted that to me, and I went looking for him, of course. I got to the house where he was supposed to live, kicked the door in, went in. His wife was there. I said, where's your husband? He's, he's, he's not here. Where is he? I don't know. Do you do his laundry? Yes. Where's the laundry? Where's his shirt? Found his shirt, which has got American blood on it. Saved the shirt as evidence. Leave a message behind, find the son of a bitch and bring him in. Uh, so, this is the reality. Your professionals, your prosecutors, your students, you have to, un I tell you these horror stories because it's hard to imagine. You really cannot imagine. And how does it impact on me? I built a wall. Somehow, uh, this was not real. Uh, my mind just shut it out as though it was a Hollywood scene of some kind. Uh, of course, as you unfortunately may have noticed already, the scene is still there. Uh, all right, let's move on from the gory story about the concentration camps. Uh, the war was over. I wanted to go home. I wanted to join the army in order to do my part. Didn't want to ever have the feeling that I stayed home while somebody else was getting killed for me. Uh, but the war was over. We won the war. I went home. The army, of course, had other ideas. You had a system to set up. You know, you have to go according to the numbers. I had already enough points to go home, so I was not running away without being entitled under the rules. And I hid away on the ship, and I went home to be home by Christmas, because Pink Crosby had said, you'll be home by Christmas. <laughs> and I had told my wife, I'll be home by Christmas. And I was honorably discharged by the United States Army, 
given five battle stars for not having been killed in any of the major battles of the war. It was the day after Christmas, 1940. When was it, 45? And uh, I was home for Christmas. <laughs> so, but yeah, and my, my honorable discharge, says the author, I uh, think, they lost my records on the way because the ship was sort of sailed out of, out of, I don't know which harbor it was, one harbor and I went to another harbor. I didn't want them to be looking for me at the time. Anyway, these are all the joys of uh, service in the military for your country and so, <laughs> so on. And uh, I was happy the war was over. I was happy I was still alive. I wanted to lead a, a normal life. I had finished law school, I had been past the bar uh, while I was in the army, and uh, so I wanted to lead a normal life. And then I wanted to find a job. There were 10 million others looking for a job. And I got a telegram once, and it probably was in response to some application I filed from the Pentagon saying, dear sir, three years they never called me sir, uh, please come to the Pentagon, we'd like to talk to you. So I went. and. Uh, I was met by a colonel, Colonel Mickey Marcus, his name was, Jewish colonel who had gone to West Point in order to get a college education. That's the way they did it. You know, some congressman and got you into the point, as they called it. And uh, he said, Betty, we want you to go back. I said, are you kidding? <laughs> he said, we'll make you a full colonel. I had been promoted to sergeant by that time. I said, <laughs> In order to get me to go back into the army, you have to declare war on Germany again. <laughs> and you have to be losing. <laughs> I said, I'm not going back into the army. So he said, well, we'll give you a civilian rank. I don't know what does that mean. Well, assimilated rank. You'll all have all the rights of a, an officer, of a colonel. And uh, I said, how long, do, how, when can I quit? He said, any time. It's up to you then. It's up to you. Well, they were very eager to have me because I happened to be the most experienced man in the world dealing with war crimes matters. I had been an academic student preparing everything that had been written on the subject. I had been in the field digging up the bodies, chasing the criminals, catching some of the criminals. Uh, and uh, they were desperate. <laughs> they were very desperate. And I said, no, I'm not going to the army. Well, before they got through with that, I was intercepted by somebody else looking for me. And this was then a colonel, later a general, Telford Taylor. Now I shift the scene a little bit, because you may not know. I'm trying to tell you things that you may not know. The International Military Tribunal trial was already on when I left Germany. Um, and uh, Justice Jackson, our excellent jurist, top American lawyer, uh, judge on the Supreme Court, head of the American delegation. The British, the French, and the Russians were also members. And this is what they talk about Nuremberg, they talk about the International Military Tribunal. I had nothing to do with the International Military Tribunal. Um, so all this publicity, they're mentioning me or giving me a pension, and giving me I don't know what, uh, it's probably under some more mistaken impression <laughs> that I am Justice Jackson <laughs> or something equivalent. <laughs> so I'd like to clarify that. I am not Justice Jackson. <laughs> However, when that trial was over, it began to lay down certain principles. And the principles I studied, they affected me, such as that crime is committed by individuals that the supreme international crime is the crime of aggression. Making war itself is the supreme crime. Uh, that criminals should be brought to justice uh, by a fair trial in which they are given all the defenses which belong to a fair trial. And uh, these were basic principles of justice which appealed to me. And. Uh, the United States had taken the lead in urging that there be additional trials, 12 additional trials, pointing to the entire hierarchy of German life, 
how was it possible that a civilized country like Germany would be able to not only tolerate this kind of crime, but with enthusiasm carry it out? Genocide and all the rest of it went with them. And in order to get the answer to that, the United States decided to put on trial the industrialists who <coughs> built Auschwitz, for example, IG Farben, provided the funny money for that. Other industrialists who seized the properties and other territories and their own concentration camps for slave labor. You had the doctors who performed medical experiments on concentration camp inmates. You had the lawyers who perverted the law and the judges uh, by political decisions. You had the diplomats who lied to the rest of the world about what they were doing and planning. You had the military themselves who engaged in all kinds of crimes. So the object wants to have 12 such trials. And Telford Taylor, who was then promoted to general, uh, was appointed by the United States president to be the chief in charge of those crimes. And while I was floating around in Washington and talking to Colonel Mickey Marcus, uh, he found out about me and he intercepted me. And he said, uh, I'd like you to go back with me for these subsequent trials and not just the military commissions, which were very speedy trials. Uh, they would take 30 at a time, give each one about two minutes to deny that they were responsible and then send them to death and take them away and take care of them. These were the military trials, military commissions about which very little is known and very little is said and just as well. Anyway, so I'm back and we're going to have new trials, 12 subsequent proceedings as they were called. And uh, Telford Taylor said, I've been checking up on your record and I see that you are occasionally insubordinate. I said, that's not correct, sir. I am usually insubordinate. <laughs> I don't obey any order that I know is illegal or stupid. <laughs> but I think I'm checking on your record too. I doubt it was an Harvard Law graduate. I doubt whether you'll give me such orders. And he smiled and he said, you go with me. <laughs> so he hired me. And my first assignment, then he was shortly thereafter, we all sailed off. Uh, he said, look, you know what it takes to convict somebody of crime. We have a number of suspects. We've got them in jail now. We've been holding high-ranking people. But if you have a suspect but no evidence, you have nothing. And uh, so we've got to get the evidence sufficient to convict them of all crimes. And uh, if you have the evidence and no suspect, you've also got nothing. So your job is to go get the evidence against specific individuals who are now suspect of being held in the Nuremberg jail and get that back to us as soon as possible be in touch with the 12 lawyers who were in charge of the other 12 cases and you funnel the materials to them. So I set up a staff of about 50 people in Berlin and we scoured through the ruins of all the offices which might have had these documents. For example, the foreign ministry office, Gestapo was completely bombed out uh, and other offices. And one day one of my researchers came in and he handed me some big loose leaf folders this size but that thick and he said look what I found and uh, I looked at it Ereignis Meldegon aus der UDSSR which meant situation reports from the Eastern Front daily reports Mark Geheimer Reissacher top secret daily reports by the commanders of special units called Einsatzgruppen Nobody knows what Einsatzgruppen means, because it doesn't mean anything. It means action groups, deliberately in disguise as to what their function was. Their function, which was given to them when the entire group of about 3,000 men were assembled and were told by the SS that their job is to follow behind the German lines as they entered Poland and on into Russia and eliminate, by which they meant kill, every single Jewish man, woman, and child they could lay their hands on and do the same regarding any other potential enemy of the Reich. 
In other words, clear the terrain, follow behind us, wipe them all out, without exception, without pity or remorse. That was their job. And I've got these daily reports reporting how much they killed every day. And I tabulated them on a little hand adding a machine. And when it reached a million killed that way, a million people murdered. I took a sample. I flew down from Berlin to Nuremberg. I said to General Taylor, General, we've got to put on another trial. He said, we can't. It's already been approved by the Pentagon. We can't. The lawyers are already all assigned. The trials are in process. We can't now change any of this. And I said, you've got to put on another trial. I have here report mass murder, black and white, unseen in human history. We're not going to let these people go. And uh, he said, can you do it in addition to your other work? I said, sure. He said, okay, you be the chief prosecutor, and you handle it. So I became the chief prosecutor of the biggest murder trial in human history. I was 27 years old. It was my first case. And since this is the International Criminal Court, I don't want you to cry here. I rested my case in two days. I convicted all of them. Thirteen of them were sentenced to death. Who's going to match that record? <laughs> I don't think any volunteers here. But he was able to do it because of the unusual circumstances, the black and white evidence of the top secret evidence possible. I didn't call a single witness except for the expert in Berlin who consolidated the reports to testify as to how he put the reports together, where they came from, that they were authentic, top secret reports from the field in Poland mostly and uh, Lithuania and other countries. And uh, aside from that, I didn't want any witnesses. I could have had a thousand witnesses. They were in the DP camps. They would each have testified that these particular defendants murdered their parents and they would have believed it. So I don't need it. Witness testimony is the most valuable. I have the best testimony conceivable. Contemporaneous top secret documents issued from the field right upon the, when the crimes have occurred. And uh, so I was able to become a great hero. <laughs> in my first case, and but I had a second case, which is of great importance to you, because the rest of my life I tried to get created an international criminal court, because Nuremberg was closed down. It's not a temporary thing. We have to have a permanent international criminal court to protect people forever. And now I stand here in this new beautiful building, but I was here in the old building as well, because uh, Marino Campo called me, he said, we're getting to the end of our first case, Ben. Uh, will you come up and do the closing statement for the prosecution? And I said, of course. So I came up and did a closing statement in the Lubanga case. That was my second case. I was 92. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're looking forward to a very active career <laughs> of handling war crimes cases, I put you on notice here, <laughs> that uh, it, it may be a, a while, although you can take consolation, cheer up kids, the crimes are still happening all around the world. You have a great career ahead of you, and uh, what we're trying to do is to sabotage your career by preventing the crimes from happening. And the way we do that is, of course, the primary function of any good lawyer was not trying to convict, but rather to prevent the crime, to deter the crime. And the crimes were miserable enough so that they deserved to be prevented. So I've given you this quick outline of my personal uh, observations and feelings, uh, which you don't normally get looking at a textbook. Uh, you are on the forefront, the front lines, of an evolving world order. Uh, because I see it from a long distance perspective, perhaps I can judge it a little bit better. People ask me, aren't you disappointed uh, by the fact that the crimes are still continuing? The courts take too long, it costs too much money, uh, there are too many objections and all that. I'm aware of all that, very much aware of it, because I've been working with the people for many years in their committees of the 
and I have a big advantage over the others. Nobody can fire me because nobody hired me. <laughs> and, and I don't take any money. I can, they can't buy me. <laughs> I call the shops as I see them. And uh, I, of course, have been very disappointed in the United States. Position taken by the United States at the end of World War II I was a hero. Boy, Americans, boy, everybody loved the Americans. No more. Because the position taken by the United States government in opposing uh, the crime of aggression appearing before court, what Jackson said was supreme international crime because all the other crimes are committed uh, in the time of war, certainly in the aggressive war, any war. Uh, so it's uh, quite disappointing to me to see the uh, position taken consistently uh, by my government uh, and uh, you reflect the point of view of half the people in the United States who feel differently. We know from election statistics, half the people are conservative, the other half are not so conservative. Those who sit here are people who believe in the rule of law, who believe that it has some deterrent effect. Some people believe, as Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm felt, or the General Feldmarshal von Moltke explained to Johann Kaspar Blünschli, who was the first guy to work on creating an international court of some kind to settle disputes. The German general said, you are depriving us of what is most glorious in life, giving your life for your country, the camaraderie, the camaraderiness of going to battle with your friends and being able to save your country's flag, you know, and all that sort of thing. This was and is still the point of view of a great number of people. I wish them good luck if they survive. But we live in a time where you cannot accept the old ideas. They have to be changed. The law is an instrumentality to protect society from types of behavior which are unacceptable which are unbearable. And the world has changed. We're no longer shooting people with poison arrows. We are now in the cyberspace age. We spend fortunes every day in a cyberspace race. Who can kill the most people? And uh, with the money that we spend, we could have taken care of the refugees who are looking just for a job or a place to live in safety of the t students who are unable to pay their tu tuition, the old people who need someone to care for them. All that money is being sent and buying and competing for massive weapons of destruction when we already have the capacity now from cyberspace of cutting off the electrical grid on planet Earth. Wake up! The present system is that if the heads of state are unable to agree they send young people out to kill other young people whom they don't even know, who may never have done them or anybody else any harm. And when they get tired of killing them themselves, they rest, each one declares victory, and after they've rested, they start again. That's the current system under which you live, under which I lived. It's increasingly dangerous every day. And uh, it's my warning to the young people particularly. And I was delighted this morning to have about 50 young kids. Uh, you know, they didn't know exactly what it was all about, but they were cheering for me. Um, we have to really revise our thinking and revise our laws to meet our needs. And I, uh, I'm not discouraged by what we have done and what we are doing. There has been a growth of the human conscience in the, my lifetime. We've done great things, the emancipation of women, same-sex marriages was considered impossible, flying was considered impossible. Uh, in the face of being able to do the impossible, I have concluded it's possible to do what's impossible, and it's possible to have a peaceful world. And uh, you have to stay with it and never be discouraged. And so I give you only a slogan, law, not war. And then I give you another slogan, say, how can you do it? I say, 
never give up. Never give up, never give up. And if you do that, I'm sure the time will come when you will see a more peaceful world than the one I have seen. And I wish you all the best of luck. inspiring presentation, your incredible life story. Uh, I'm sure that there will be some questions in the room and we have a colleague with a mic and another one with a mic. So to whom can I? And this year is in 98 years old, so you have to speak loud and clear. Okay. Be the gentleman may help me translate some of this. Uh, Mr. Phillips, I just like I'm from South Africa, so you know I speak, I don't have to go into it. But the problem is that I got to historians, both Asians, Europeans, Americans, they believe that the Treaty of Versailles was a real cause of the Second World War. And you wanted to know why did the Germans act in such a way. There was a moratorium on their behavior and the movements and the economy and everything what they did. And secondly, I'll tell you, uh, I'm of Indian origin. So every time they commemorate the Second World War, the Sinti and the Romas are never represented. And millions of them were also killed. I think you know about that. And I find it that, uh, you know, when Oppenheimer was in charge of the Almos uh, Almos, nuclear project, uh, when he went to President Truman in the White House to tell him to uh, with his friends like Bertrand Russell, Einstein, uh, another Christian influence, Gandhi and everybody, uh, they were together and they were against the use of natural suction. When he went to Truman, you know what Truman told, told him? He doesn't want the Americans to use the nuclear weapon again after the use in Japan. You know what he told uh, uh, his uh, secretary? It's not a, a nice word what he said. He said, don't bring that motherfucker again to my office. Truman said that. It was on the uh, television. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the things. And you know we had Pol Pot, we had Chile, we had Ami, we had Mobutu. We had lots of things. Lots of people have been killed. Mm -hmm. But I hope, as you said, that everybody takes responsibility and we'll have a better world. Well, uh, you've raised a point there which I think is very important, and that is the attitude. Uh, I did a, a show recently for uh, 60 Minutes for CBS. It's been shown around the world in the last week or so, with millions of people viewing it. And uh, the uh, inquirer who was handling it said to me, well, you've seen all these horrible things happening. Uh, how could you deal with these horrible things? people. Um, what do you think about them being such horrible people? And I said, did you think the man who dropped the bomb on Japan was a horrible person? And the question that you pose and the other question are the same. In wartime, war makes murderers out of otherwise decent people. My lead defendant, Dr. Otto Oldendorf, I picked them on the basis of their education and their rank, uh, father of five children, fairly honest man. Uh, he was convicted of murdering over 90,000 Jews, approximately 90,000 Jews. Uh, babies shot, one shot at a time, thousands of them. And he explained it by saying that Hitler had information that the Russians planned to attack and uh, therefore was necessary for the German people, the German army, to prevent that attack by a preemptive first strike and strike before the Russians did. And uh, he felt justified in doing that. <coughs> None of my defendants had any remorse whatsoever. They were all well-educated people, no regrets, no remorse. They thought they were 
patriots serving their country. The American Code of Conduct and Warfare also allows preemptive self-defense. I arranged for Ollendorf to hang by the neck for eight minutes until he was dead. That's the chief prosecutor for the United States. Doesn't make me feel good. Uh, so you're touching on a very difficult problem of how otherwise normal and decent people can take the position of leadership in mass murder. And my personal conclusion is we have to stop war-making because in war, all the other social controls <coughs> are submerged. And seeing the pretty women around here, I assure you, there has never been a war without massive rape of the women. World War II, I saw it happening in Berlin where the Russian soldiers were part of their victory prize. They were told, now go and rape the Germans. And uh, they did with a vengeance. Uh, so it's war itself, which we have to change. And the only way we can do that is if we change the hearts and minds of people. Because for generations we have glorified, for centuries we have glorified killing in war. For the beauty of the country, the terrain, the power, and so on. It's crazy. Today it's crazy. It's not King Arthur going out and fighting in a battle with one man. Today the victims are all innocent civilians, including thousands of children. I saw it. I know that you're the victims and, and so on. I've seen it. And it's much worse now than it was then. It's much more dangerous. So having more weapons is not a road to more security. It's more insecurity. And uh, you also need the courage to compromise. It's not a cowardly thing to compromise or to try to settle. And you need courage not to be discouraged. And uh, that's why I go around and talk to you. It's your world, not mine anymore. But if you have the courage not to be discouraged, you see the progress which we are making toward the awakening of the human conscience. People are now concerned with what's happening. They haven't found the solutions yet, but they know it's happening in different parts of the world. They're reporting on it. They are sending commissions. They are trying to begin to hold accountable through courts like this one. There are now dozens of international criminal courts functioning today in various parts of the world. Tremendous strides forward toward a more civilized world, but we still have a long way to go, and I know that. So I appeal to the young people, maybe the little kids who are with me this morning, uh, to pick up this flag or whatever you want to call it, this, this torch, and carry it forward when I'm no longer here. Okay. Thank you. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. Sir, only last week, uh, my name is Khaled Ahmed Chaudhary, representing International Human Rights Commission. Only last week, during a seminar about extraordinary court chambers in Africa. And we were discussing about uh, sentence of uh, Hussein Habre of Chad. You just mentioned about electric chair. And in, during that seminar, I showed my readiness to face a guillotine or hanging till death to raise a question which I am going to raise in front of you, because you asked me, what would you like me to say something? Yes. Would it be possible for you to demand for an extraordinary court chamber in Washington, D.C., to get Bush, Blair, and Dick Cheney, and you to become a chief prosecutor over there? Thank you very much. <laughs> Because of my advanced years, I wouldn't be eager to get the job. <laughs> but uh, certainly, a prima facie case can be made out uh, for the United States committing the crime of aggression uh, in various jurisdictions. Uh, but one of the difficulties, the main difficulty facing the world community today is we have no enforcement mechanism. We were promised one when we thought we won World War II. Nobody wins a war. Everybody loses in a war. But after World War II, we had the United Nations Charter, which called for disarmament, which we haven't done. 
It called for an international military force, which we haven't done. It called for an impartial security council to be responsible for the safety of the citizens, which it hasn't done. Uh, it called for enforcement through social justice, which hasn't been done. And all of these promises made after about 100 million people were killed in World War II, nobody knows for sure how many people die in war, I, know, I can assure you of that. Nobody knows how many die of disease, of heartache, and so on. Uh, hasn't been done. And uh, we're paying the price. Until we do that, until we have built the mechanisms necessary to settle this disputes. Hey, I'm going to show where you go. Until we build the devices necessary, a court, an objective court necessary to settle the disputes, the contestants have no other, no other choice but to go to war with each other. And this is what's happening. And it's a, it's a shame because who has been killed? Innocent people had nothing to do with it. Children are being killed, being slaughtered. Now every country in Africa and Southern America, all around the globe. But there's an awareness, there's a court, it's here, it's functioning, it's too expensive, it's too big, it's too inadequate, doesn't have enough people, they're approaching the wrong thing. <laughs> I can give you a hundred things are wrong, but it's wonderful. It's here, and uh, it's beginning, and it will be changed. This is a prototype, and it's the beginning of a new process in human relations. The most important beginning and the most important instrumentality begins with the rule of law. So you're on the right track kids <laughs> and uh, uh, just never give up. Thank you. Any other? Yes, in the back. Thanks so much. Um, Can you speak up? This year is 98 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Oh yeah, I think you hear me now. Thanks so much for inspiring us and for um, encouraging us to remain on the path of uh, criminal law, humanitarian law, and for sharing your uh, your story with us. Um, my question is: um, in in the case of your first case and your second case, where you were, or um, um, you had to face, uh, and where you, you have made the impossible possible, whether prosecuting criminal, uh, criminal um, uh, war criminals at Nuremberg or someone as Thomas Lubanga, we, I would like to ask, so in those hours where you might think this is not possible, um, I, I, I don't know how to handle this, who is your inspiration or what? Or uh, what, what made you think, okay, I can tell these young people never give up and uh, have courage? My inspiration comes from what I have experienced and what I have seen. Uh, you cannot go through this type of experience without coming away feeling that it's an awful, terrible thing, as it is. And I have never forgotten that, and it never leaves me. Uh, and that drives me to try to do whatever I can so that it's not repeated in the future. And it is being repeated all over the world still. So I do the best I can, try to educate by talking to the people, by writing books, by writing articles, by doing lectures, by doing videos, by talking to young kids, talking to old kids, whatever I can do at the age of when I should have been long retired. I don't know what retired means. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what I do. And if everybody would do the same, we'd get there faster. Uh, and you are doing the same. Of course, you have to make a living and you have to feed the family and all kinds of things. But uh, I did that too. And everything I have left, I give back. I give it all away to the different organizations, including the Holocaust Museum in Washington and others who are trying to advance the rule of law to protect the rest of humanity. More than that, I cannot do. I think we have two more questions at least in that same corner. Maybe, yes. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Solomon Avery. I actually come from Ghana. I'm a student at the International Institute of Social Studies. And my question is quite uh, simple but really intriguing. Is I want to find out what's your take on the claim that uh, the International Criminal Court is 
are actually meant for African leaders, especially with the recent uh, expression of withdrawal, uh, interest of withdrawal from, uh, from the court by South Africa, Burundi, Gambia, and other countries. Thank you. Uh, are you asking why the African countries are seem to be withdrawing from the court? Uh, well, the suggestion that the court is biased against black people, against African people, is a, it's not only absurd, it's insulting. The chief prosecutor, as you know, is Fatou Ben Souda. He's a very black person coming from Africa, from the Gambia. Uh, do you think that she would be serving as chief prosecutor of court which was discriminating against people because of their color? Uh, I don't believe it for a moment because I know her very well. And uh, it's just not true. It's just a lie. It's an attempt to avoid facing justice by saying we're all going to quit. They can quit and they may quit. They throw themselves backward instead of going forward toward a more peaceful world ruled by law. They say we don't want to be part of it because we think you're going to discriminate against us. That's not a discrimination because of your color. It's a discrimination because they can't get into the country to get the evidence to convict. The people who are running the country are themselves suspect. And so they don't let anybody in. And you have to know the local language in order to be able to get the evidence. And you can't get in. So what are you going to do? Uh, you do the best you can. And it's a slow progress, but we're getting there. And you must never give up. And you must never lose hope because that's what drives human endeavor. That's what should keep you going as well as me, because you have more years ahead of you than I've got left. Okay. Lady in the black shirt also. And a question, I think. I don't know who the lady in the black shirt is, but I've got the mic now. Uh, <laughs> um, my question is a very much a side little query, and it's about your time in Nuremberg. Um, I'm the former Chief of Language Services at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. And uh, as it happens, simultaneous interpretation was born in New Nuremberg. Those who were setting up the tribunal faced the conundrum of running proceedings simultaneously in four languages. So for, they had to devise a system. Simultaneous interpretation barely existed then. But they, were, they sourced a number of polyglots and put a system in place to do that. And it was a success, I think. The tri trials were able to take place um, uh, across language barriers. Now, I don't know from listening to you, because you didn't call, call witnesses in the Einsatzgruppen uh, case, whether uh, that made an impression on you at all. But I was wondering if you have any recollection of uh, that new phenomenon of simultaneous interpretation in an international uh, criminal court. Well, uh, that's an interesting question. <coughs> I didn't call any witnesses because I didn't need any witnesses. I had evidence which was better than individual witness testimony. But uh, in addition, of course, we had the testimony of the defendants themselves. They didn't deny that they had committed the crimes. They just challenged whether it was criminal, including shooting thousands of children one shot at a <coughs> time. They thought that was a patriotic duty and it was not a criminal act. But there was no question that the charges were fully grounded in documentary proof confirmed by the testimony of all the defendants, really. Could no one get up except the one man who said, I hear it here for the first time. That's the guy I could have strangled with my hands. But uh, uh, otherwise, it was general admission of all that. And it's the duty of a lawyer to make sure it's a fair trial. Uh, if your circumstances are such that you cannot provide a fair trial because you don't have anybody who speaks the language. Uh, or you can't get it into evidence for some reason. That's one of the problems to be overcome. And uh, you will overcome them, you are overcoming them, but slowly. It's not something you can do quickly or easily, but you have to keep going. Again with a black shirt. Black shirt? Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not a black shirt. Happy that talk. Uh, thank you for your talk. I just had a question. I'm studying international criminal law now, and I've studied international relations before. So for me, this area is where law and politics really come close together. Uh, how do we make sure that we can change political will to ensure that law 
is the one that is controlling politics rather than the other way around, particularly with yeah. new institutions? It's a vital question. Uh, you have recognized that law is dependent upon political action and political decisions, and we are suffering from that today uh, in the form of the United States as well as other countries. Well, for political reasons, we suffered it a bit at Nuremberg. We had to end the trials, and criminals convicted of mass murder were set free. And the 3,000 men who every day were committing mass murder, no doubt, uh, never even tried. So there are limits to what you can do within any specific time frame. And uh, today, uh, without political change, you will not have the type of um, public support that you need in order to carry out this type of new approach to human behavior. But it can be done. Changing the hearts and minds of people is what the, my declared goal is. I have a whole program running on in that direction. And you have to begin in the cradle to teach people that killing somebody because you disagree with them is not a way of settling the problem. Uh, and at the moment, many people prefer the political solution. And we have the power, we'll use it. It goes back, you know, to, to Thucydides, in this history of the Peloponnesian Wars. He said, we have more ships than you have, so why don't you give up right away, and then we'll only take you as slaves. And if you want to fight, we'll kill you all. It's a political decision. So we are captives of a political system, and I'm hopeful that as we go into a world which is, in which everybody is equally educated and we're moving in that direction, the little computers are going to do it in the next 25, 50 years, the world will change. Because they'll see it makes no difference if you kill a man in Timbuktu or you kill a man in Chicago. Their human life must be protected and needs to be protected. But it'll be a while before we can do it. Meanwhile, work on the political side as well. You protest your politicians. Say, so why are you spending so many billions on new methods of killing people? How about spending more of it on helping people stay alive? Uh, that's a fair question. And if they get enough such questions coming from their constituents, I think they'll get the point. I hope, anyway. I think we have still time for one or two questions, so. Yes, there. Yeah. I think again with a, no, no, with no. a black jacket. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Fels, thank you so much for sharing part of your history and this of yourself with us. It was really inspiring. I study international relations and diplomacy in The Hague, and you mentioned that from breaking, um, it was the wall that you built around yourself that kept you like going, and also that you just like zoned out. But I wondered what kept you remain the social trust? Because I can imagine that if you see so much atrocities happening, that it's really difficult to keep believing in the good in people. And I wonder what kept you able to now address the public and step out on the street and think, OK, I can feel safe in a way, because the majority of the people still is good. Thank you so much, and keep going. Done. And you can <laughs> take that for me. Any questions? Sorry. No, I was sorry. Yeah. So, sorry, I was right. Okay. No, excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Just more like this The question is, with all the horror yeah. that you've seen, yeah. how do you still have basic belief in the goodness of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's an important question. Now, it's been translated to me, and I blame it on the ear. It doesn't hear everything. Uh, with all the horrors that I have seen, how can I still believe in the goodness of human beings? Oh, well. There are some human beings who are mean and rotten, but most of them are not. Uh, even the mass murderers believed they were doing a patriotic act for their country. I'm sure they were kind to their cats and dogs. I'm sure they went to listen to Wagner, and they could quote Goethe to you, and were otherwise very nice people. Not all of them, of course, but uh, the ones that I selected based upon their excellent education as well as on their high military rank. I think they fit that description uh, of people who thought they were serving their country and uh, never felt guilty enough to say, I'm sorry, 
Uh, let me add a little point, uh, which I think is appropriate. Some years ago, the German government called me, the German Foreign Ministry, and said they wanted to give me their highest civilian award, Verdienst Kreuz Erste Klasse. And uh, something, it looks very nice award, it looks like Rommel was wearing it, put it around your neck, you know, like this. And I said, I want to think about that. And I met first with various survivor groups. I had set up all the restitution programs to compensate all the survivors, Jews and non-Jews equally, by the West German government. And I met with the survivor groups, and I said, the Germans have offered me their highest award. How do you think I should react? I wanted to get their opinion. Most of them said, what? You're not going to take a medal from the people who murdered my parents, are you? And uh, a terrible thing, you know, what are they trying to do? We're giving you the medal, you know, the guy who hanged out these and who forced down their throat from very expensive restitution compensation program. And I listened to all their arguments, and then I said, well, I have now considered your points of view, and I'm going to accept it. Uh, I'm going to accept the medal, because I interpret that to be an effort by the new generation to say they're sorry. And uh, their parents were ashamed to admit that they were responsible for crime, but by singling me out as the recipient of their highest civilian award, it was their way of apologizing, and it's a new generation, and we shouldn't hold the children responsible for the crimes of their father or their grandfather. And so I have the medal. <laughs> Last question, if there is one. If not, then thanks so much for your excellent questions and of course also for taking the time to respond to the uh, very good answers. I think this has been a wonderful evening that all of us will not soon forget. Um, I would like to thank everybody for coming to the Oster Institute tonight, particularly of course Benjamin Ferenc. And I think I speak on behalf of all of us here tonight. I would like to wish you all the best and continue to inspire audiences around the world, uh, in your own words, never give up. Um, and I would also like to extend my gratitude to Don Ferenc, um, to the municipality of The Hague, and also my colleagues here at the Astor Institute who have made all of this possible, also logistically. And I finally, I would like to draw your attention to a few other lectures at the Astor Institute that you might be interested in. Uh, this Wednesday, the 17th at 7 p.m., Professor Sharp will provide a lecture with the title How the War on ISIS Has Changed International Law. And on the 7th of June, King Atibo Otsabo and Megan Hurst will speak about the rights of victims to a fair trial, a fictional reality, comments on ICC and STL practice. Now, for these and other lectures, please check the website of the Austrian Institute, uh, or better, sign up to our mailing list. Now, again, many thanks for coming. Thanks again. My name is Frenz, and to all, enjoy the rest of it. Thank, Thank you. you.